I just want to start by saying thank you again to uh, Stephen. It was a great lecture. I agree with that. Well, there we go. Um, <laughs> I agree. It seems like a little bit overkill if I just some people up. But thank you so much to Stephen. Great lecture. I agree with everything he said. Um, <laughs> I really wanted a podium. Uh, I asked for a podium yesterday. They couldn't get it for me, but it's my fault because I asked yesterday. Um, which is kind of a bummer because I have to wear pants. Um, <laughs> uh, it's also kind of a bummer because like, I have a tendency to drift. I was sort of hoping I could cling, cling to the podium for security, but I didn't do it. <clears throat> I was surprised when I was asked to do this because I am bad at most things. <laughs> That's oh, wow, this is like a really bummer way to start a lecture. You know, I think that was the whole thing, like, uh, what have you learned to see me? Well, I've learned that I'm bad at most things. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's not, by the way. I have a whole thing right there, don't worry. <laughs> I'm going to put that somewhere else. Hold on. Great, I'll do that part later. I'm going to start again, okay? <clears throat> it's so great to be here. To speak here in front of my peers, to make some kind of thesis for peace of mind. Because being wined and dined is nice, but I hold the dice that the greater slice have to try in other ways to unwind. Most of the time, anyway. This university is a blessing in disguise, disguised only by the lies that our negativity applies, but disguised nonetheless. School can feel like a boolean, on or off, pass or fail, good or bad, sung or hail. You're either all in or you're checked out, full steam or besieged by doubt. You're 100% and you're meant to succeed or you're distracted, hyperactive, slacking on redacting your next action item because you're too busy fizzing over your too oft scoffed at hobbies. But like chili peppers and chocolate, it's not the apocalypse when opposites attract, and the secret of happiness is not just to live, but to live with a mind that wines and dines itself, on the bounty of the earth that moves us and marries us to its too many subjects and realms multifarious. The first thing I learned at CMU was what it means to focus. Most people I know came to CMU because they already had a really solid idea of what they wanted to do. It would be a pretty disconcerting faux pas if someone in the School of Drama was like, yeah, I like acting, but I don't know if I'm going to do it for a career, which is ridiculous, <laughs> because it's a ridiculous career. On every level, it's ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> we are ridiculous people competing for a few jobs with hundreds of other people who would do that job for free if given the opportunity. Uh, according to the U.S. Department of Education, there were 90,000 bachelor's degrees awarded to visual and performing arts in 2011. That's too many. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean like, to, I'm not making any sort of spiritual judgment on people who get like visual performing arts degrees. I'm just saying economically, practically, as there are not 90,000 new jobs created every year. So it's purely economically, it's, it's too many. So. I would venture to guess that a significant number of those people ending up end up in careers requiring very different skill sets. And none of this is meant to be depressing, by the way. Uh, au contraire. It's a tough job scene for everyone out there, and we couldn't be in a better place to counteract that. CMU sets people up. In 2013, 53% of CMU graduates left here with jobs in hand, and only 11% were unsuccessfully looking for work. CMU gives its students a competitive edge like none other. Students arrive with a passion and leave with understanding, skill, and connections. That's true across all the options I've encountered. CMU hammers us into extremely desirable tools by applying a ton of heat. To use the big fish in a small pond metaphor, attending CMU is like being thrown into a shark-infested pool. Uh, at times, I felt like I was drowning. But most of the time, drowning us is this, way's, this school's way of teaching us how to swim. My sophomore year, I took 15-1-12 with Cosby. It was probably the hardest I've ever worked on a single class in my life. This girl knows. She's <laughs> laughing. <laughs> um, I learned an enormous amount and loved every minute of it, though. So much so that I ended up TAing for it my, the first semester of my junior year. But here's the difference between sophomore year for actors and junior year. Sophomore year, you're in no-shows, and you only have one, two, or three-week crew assignment. Junior year, I was in four shows, which meant I was in rehearsal six days a week, 12 weeks out of the semester. That's most of the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the traits I think CMU people share in general is an absolute abhorrence for admitting defeat. But a big part of learning to focus 
is learning how to recognize when something is happening in your life that you really can't afford. Time is currency, and I just didn't have enough of it to invest properly in being a TA. At the end of the fall semester, I went to Cosby and resigned because I wasn't being the TA that that course deserved. I wasn't happy with the work I was doing, and I didn't have the currency to improve it that year. But I'm so happy I did it. I'm glad I tried it. Even though I was drowning, it was the sort of drowning that builds character, I think. That feeling of being overwhelmed, I've come to realize that sometimes it's okay. If it lasts for more than a semester, you know, obviously see how you can scale back. Drop a class, drop a job, talk to your parents, seek counsel, whatever you need. Uh, but what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And just remember that really, uh, it's not the school that's trying to kill you. It's yourself. This is an important distinction to make, actually, because it's the difference between victimhood and agency. We're here because we are driven to push ourselves to the limit, and that means we're going to screw up a lot along the way. But that's what college is for, finding your limits and then playfully batting at them until they recede into the horizon. <laughs> this year, I feel more secure in my ability as an actor than ever before, but I've also choreographed a dance piece. I wrote and performed my own one-man show for Playground. I successfully mounted an ongoing webcomic, and I began to professionally design websites for actors in my program. Not all of these things relate to acting, of course, which brings me to my second point. I am bad at most things. <laughs> See, I told you I'd come back to it. Um, <clears throat> I am bad at most things. Uh, I'm good at some things. Here's a list of things that I'm good at. Acting. Making coffee, drinking coffee, running tabletop RPGs. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a list of things that I'm okay at. Programming, racquetball, writing, singing, drawing, math. Here's a list of things that I'm bad at. <clears throat> Unexpected social interactions, chemistry, Dancing, rocket science, playing any instrument, playing any team sport, gymnastics, cooking, baking, playing Dota, windsurfing, skateboarding, rhythm exercises, basket weaving, pottery, interior decorating, gardening, interstellar travel. <laughs> so I'm bad at most things. In fact, so are you. All of you. Everyone, in fact. Take comfort in that. Next time someone's like, isn't Andre Sutantu just such a good programmer? You can be like, yeah, but have you seen him try to analyze silt from the ocean floor? Pfft, <laughs> Isn't Taylor Rose such a good actor? Yeah, but how is she at mountain climbing? <laughs> or, man, Steven Sorreo plays the trumpet pretty well. Sure, but could he properly taxidermize a chinchilla? Yeah. <laughs> the fact is... <laughs> <laughs> the fact is, there are simply too many things. For everything you have tried, there are a hundred things that you haven't. So no matter who you are, you are not good at everything. That's science. Um, that said, I've spent my whole life feeling like I am naturally bad at things. Like, extra bad. I've been told that this isn't true, and, you know, rationally it seems unlikely that I was actually born talentless and cursed. <laughs> Nonetheless, that's always how I've felt. I've felt that I had to kick and bite and claw my way through the filth of my own inadequacy to achieve the bare minimum of respectable skill. This feeling has become especially acute recently, um, probably because I'm surrounded by incredibly talented people here, but I wouldn't be surprised if most of those talented people felt like I do. We came to CMU to focus on a single trade, but choosing one thing has always been my weakness. I became an actor because only through acting could I at least pretend to be good at everything. It is my great existential lie. <laughs> but it's also my way of opening myself up to the infinite possibilities of the universe. I said that choosing a single field is my weakness, and that's because I have a hard time thinking of a single field I wouldn't be interested in. And some of the things I've learned at CMU is that with such emphasis on excelling in a single field, with the incredible focus that CMU demands, it becomes doubly important to preserve, nourish, and encourage the sense of adventurism that was perhaps most pure when we were children. Now, when I say adventurism, I just want to briefly say, well, what I mean by that is taking the class that you have no idea what it entails. It means um, 
talking to someone you've never talked to before. It means putting yourself out there in a place where, you know, frankly, you may not be excellent at first, um, to use Stephen's verbiage. <clears throat> and that's uh, an important thing, I think. Adventurism at a place like this can be tough because if we want to try something new, we are guaranteed to start out as the weakest fish in that shark-filled pool I discussed earlier. But because CMU is so incredible at attracting skilled and focused students and faculty, there can be no better place for adventurism to flourish. In a single semester of programming, I advanced well beyond the rank of a total novice. After a single semester of web design, I felt comfortable asking to be paid for my services. Because everyone is pushed to their limits here, the educational acceleration or skill velocity over time is greater here, I would guess, than at any place you will call your home for the rest of your life. Adventurism takes you a little closer to being that fictive jack of all trades. It expands your mind and makes you more creative and well-rounded expert in the field that you came here to focus on. But most importantly, I think adventurism is a key contributing factor to a healthy sense of joie de vivre, and therefore a necessary part of that weird thing we're always trying to define, calculate, and finally achieve happiness. The last segment of this lecture isn't exactly called happiness, but it might just as well be. Some of you may be a little ahead of me, and you're thinking, focus and adventurism are kind of mutually exclusive, aren't they? Well, you're not, not right about that, but you're not not wrong either. The most important thing I've learned to see in you is a sense of balance between my thirst for adventure and my dedication to my craft. And the simple truth is that balance, like happiness, doesn't have an ironclad formula attached to it. In many ways, balance is even more ephemeral, because a balanced life is pretty much totally subjective. It's unavoidably true that pursuit of adventurism comes at the expense of your focus. This is just patently true. Time is currency. And if we spend some in one place, we don't have it in another. But I believe that there is a magical ratio for every person that reflects the optimal balance of career focus with professional diversification. I'll call this the focus ratio, as it's the relationship between time spent within your focus and time spent outside of it. What I've learned is that everyone has different focus ratios. It's okay to have a particularly high focus ratio, needing very few outside activities to remain sane. And it's also okay to have a low focus ratio. You can still find success in your field, even if you need lots and lots of hobbies. That's me, for instance. I stress this because it's easy to get into a negative pattern of thinking where any time spent outside of your field is guilt-ridden self-indulgence. This is so pernicious and bad, I can't emphasize that enough. Because if you have a low focus ratio, you simply harvest energy and inspiration from a wide variety of subjects and practices. When your inner adventurer doesn't get enough time, you suffer from underexposure and begin to wonder if you made the right choice in choosing your field of focus. This, above all else, is a dangerous mindset to be in here. I've come up with this term, focus ratio, because I think it would be helpful to view this as similar to introversion versus extroversion. Both psychological types can find a great deal of success in their personal and professional lives. The only difference is the way in which they restore and generate social energy. Similarly, I think having a high focus ratio, or being mono-attentive, versus having a low focus ratio or polyattentive should not be read as an indicator of future success, but rather as a guidepost for how to maximize one's professional, scholarly, and human productivity. Finding your balance may be a lifelong work of progress, uh, but identifying your focus ratio and determining roughly where you fall on the monoattentive, polyattentive sliding scale could be a non-judgmental step in the right direction and it might save you countless sleepless nights wondering if you deserve to be here, if you deserve to be doing this, if you even want to be, or if you've really made a huge mistake. Let me dispel that phantasm right now. If you're willing to put in the effort, you deserve to be here. If you think you simply aren't good enough, there is no better place than to change, to change that than here. If you graduate and you still can't find work, then having developed interests outside of your focus will keep you sane and maybe one of them will blossom into a career and become your focus. And that's okay too. You're very lucky to live now instead of 500 years ago, namely because we get to live twice as long. <laughs> <laughs>
there's an oft-cited and pretty clearly erroneous statistic that says people, that young people today can expect seven career changes in their lives. That's not true. But it is true that young people today can expect to see several job changes in the first few years of employment. So it's okay to do a bunch of different things. It's healthy to focus on a single crop as long as you have one or two fields left to cultivate. It's healthy to plant seven different kinds of bananas because odds are at least one of them will turn out to be fungus resistant. <laughs> Andrew Carnegie said, my heart is in the work. And I take that with a grain of salt primarily because it sounds biologically unwise. <laughs> but, also, but also because I think that the metaphorical human heart is too great to be contained in a single word. The metaphorical human heart is made vast by our imaginations, made strong by our dedications, and made to hold whatever we choose to love. And only with an open heart can we truly soar. So that's pretty much it. Please excuse my abuse conventions, the hiding behind rhyming in a sublime avoidance tactic, cleverly guarding the start and finish of this minimalist lecture with structure semi-poetic. Unconventional etiquette, I know, but there you go. The point is, when you're pointed, your mind becomes rigid in a legitimate way, like a submarine built for a very specific purpose, adept at a depth charge, if not at a depth end. But now we have amphibious vehicles and a far more complicated future in general. So the secret of happiness is not just joie de vivre, but joie de venture, the sheer delight of demanding expansion in several different scary directions at once. Thank you so much for coming and have a great day.